présentons un violon d'Antonius Stradivarius à Crémone 1714. It could be said that the magical sound of the violin, viola and cello was born in the forest of the violins. Legend has it that in the late 17th century, Antonio Stradivari wandered in this forest, tapping the trees in search of resonant wood, and luthiers have continued to come here ever since. Se gli avete sì crescono pianissimo nel tempo, quindi fanno degli anelli di accrescimento molto regolari. Questo permette appunto questa regolarità, è molto pregiata nel campo della liuteria, in quanto permette una diffusione del suono, una trasmissione del suono all'interno degli strumenti molto regolare. Each day the lutea shapes spruce and maple into a form 450 years old, searching for an idea of sound held within his imagination. His violin's voice has not yet been revealed. It has no history with which to seduce potential owners, and it does not yet display the beautiful marks of a life well lived. As he works, the legacy of two 18th century craftsmen touched by the divine weighs heavy on his mind. Da quelli, diciamo, recenti, possiamo dire di, di di importanti liutai e costruttori che sono venuti da noi a scegliere il legno. Non possiamo dire violini famosi perché un violino non diventa mai famoso prima di avere 150-200 anni. Penso che qualsiasi liutaio del mondo vorrebbe avere un pezzo di musica. In the early 1700s, Antonio Stradivari, a craftsman from the small Italian town of Cremona, set the benchmark for every luthier that would follow. At the height of his powers, he made a violin that would become known as the Messiah, a name meaning the chosen or the anointed king. This sacred idea has since come to be associated with all the string instruments of both Stradivari and his Cremonese contemporary Giuseppe Guarneri del Gesù. E anche il meno colto come posso essere io è a conoscenza anche superficialmente del, dell'anima di Cremona che è il violino e quindi la storia di Antonio Stradivari. Stradivari and Guarneri del Gesù's instruments, labeled with the sign of the cross and anointed with mythical orange varnish would become supremely desired objects. Their siren voices have for centuries beguiled the kings, lords, barons and virtuosos who established their status. Today, market culture is changing the very meaning of the violin forever, and speculators, profiteers and collectors, rather than makers, have now become the principals in the story of the violin. Yehudi Menuhin once said, a great violin is alive, 
Its shape embodies its maker's intentions, and its wood stores the history or the soul of its successive owners. I never play without feeling that I have released, or alas, violated spirits. It's a miracle. It is like finding the right partner in your life as a person. It's of all the qualities you expect from an instrument, the best. There is some magic in these instruments. It is not just wood, varnish, and strings. It has the power, but also the delicacy. It has the warmth, but also the cutting energy. I think that the secret of these instruments is not so much just in your imagination as in the actual sound. The analogy is probably the painter who has you know, the more colours you give him in his palette, the more he'll be able to do, and that's certainly the case with the Strad. The type of sound that comes most naturally to this violin is the type of sound that I just have in my head, and I think that's why I originally gravitated to it so much. And then started the difficult process of <laughs> trying to find someone to buy it. The first thing you did in the old days was you married some rich person, and they then got their father to give you as a wedding present a Strad. But I have noticed that um, I think the rich spouses are very hard to find these days. One thing has changed dramatically that uh, a young musician hardly ever can hope to afford a big instrument. Musicians are the best people to own these instruments. And I think that not having security of tenure, not being able to build that relationship with the thing which is actually their voice, is, is fundamental. In Austria, Germany, Scandinavia, Japan, America and Canada, major banks, private and public institutions and government art organizations now invest in instruments to lend to their leading musicians. The UK has no such organization, much to the detriment of its top soloists. Being a young classical player requires determination. So whoever wins this tonight deserves our unreserved admiration. And the winner is Ruth Palmer. The leading British violinist Ruth Palmer will never own the violin she plays. Her award-winning recording was made on a violin borrowed for a week from a dealer. Before each concert, she has to search for an instrument to play on, and she is not alone. I have to borrow a violin in order to be able to be a violinist. And that means I need someone that is very rich <laughs> to be able to lend it to me. And unfortunately in Britain we have no tradition of either private individuals or banks buying instruments and learning them to play as for life. I just don't think the private sector really espouses the cause of looking after um, the arts in every shape or form, let alone something as esoteric as musical instruments. I believe Josh Bell and Gil Shaham are, to my knowledge, the last two violinists who bought violins with their earnings substantially. And this is, this is in the early 90s, actually, that they did. If I were starting out now, uh, starting my career, Trying to buy an instrument like this would be impossible. I swear that the London Philharmonic or the London Symphony Orchestra or any of those orchestras, when I was young, sounded better than they do now. The reason for that is because the, for a, a, a year's gross salary, um, the players could buy themselves a wonderful old instrument. And they were making a sound that I would say they no longer make. What for me on the table is just one violin next to another and I like that one more means the difference between a hundred thousand pounds and three million pounds. Whereas, you know, it's just a violin.
but that one's better. Maybe it's only a 10% difference that, you know, over a great modern instrument, but that difference, that top extra quality of sound is really makes all the difference, and, and it is the, the, the colors, uh, the palette that you have to work with with an instrument like this. It just opens up your imagination. The best Strads, the best Guarneri del Jesus are the best violins in the world. They are famous for a reason. Part of the value of great old instruments is the direct connection they offer to the history of music. Musicians, collectors and listeners like to believe that the instrument's incredible stories can be heard in their unique sound. Mozart has heard it by Jean-Baptiste Mara, who was the owner in Mozart's time. Mozart didn't like the cellist. He doesn't speak about the cello, but the cellist he hated. He loved his wife, that was the famous singer, Mara. But later in the history, 1960, there was a ship which uh, tried to cross the Rio de la Plata, caught fire, and Amadeo Baldovino and his colleagues just saved their lives. The fiddle player took his fiddle into the lifeboat. The cello player didn't take his cello in a big wooden case, just saved his life. Next morning, in a wooden case, the cello came to, to the coast and there was a cello in it, but it didn't look like a cello because it was in 50 parts and one year restoration and then it looked again. This violin has had its share of, of intrigue. Hubermann was playing on it at Carnegie Hall in New York in 1936. He uh, left the violin backstage for a moment, and when he came back, it was gone. He never saw the violin again. But sure enough, 50 years later, in 1986, the violin emerged again, and, and it turns out that the thief had been playing on the instrument in cafes and various other things, and, and, and uh, he must have had a, it must have been a difficult secret to keep that he was playing on this amazing uh, Hubermann Strad, but he really couldn't tell anybody. That, uh, that's torture, it must have been torture in itself. The Messiah Stradivari is the most famous violin of all. In the 1930s, the Hill family were determined that it should not fall into the hands of anyone who wanted to do something so sacrilegious as play it, so they placed the violin in Oxford's Ashmolean Museum on the condition that it must never be played again. One of the conditions of the Hill gift is that these instruments are not allowed out of their cases. This has upset quite a few people over the years, but it's the finest violin in the world, full stop. Its story started in 1682 as a woman and two men were burned at the stake in England for witchcraft. A man named Halley sighted a comet. Louis XIV of France moved his court to Versailles and Vesuvius erupted, while Antonio Stradivari kicked the trees in the forest of the violins in search of wood that would make a violin to rule them all. Finished in 1716, it has been hidden away throughout its life. Successive owners had to die before it was parted with. Henry Ford once offered a blank check for it, but his offer was declined. The unique state of preservation that makes it so sought after has also attracted speculation that it is in fact a fake. Everybody who's, who's seen it seen it for the first time, um, thinks it's a copy. It's frightening when you see it, because it, it is so fresh. It's, it's very fresh. I've been able to study that instrument for half an hour. It's not long, but it was enough for me. It is a 1716 Stradivari. The extraordinary thing about it and all works of art, and certainly all great Stradivaris, is they all have a story to tell. And when you think, if only they could tell their stories, how fascinating that would be. I mean, they, they almost have souls.
As the value and status of Stradivari violins continues to rise, more and more are now joining the Messiah in museums and institutions around the world, changing forever the connection between musicians and their instruments. Towards the end of the 1960s, the teaching method developed by Dr. Suzuki in Japan led to a near universal education in Western music. As millions of children were taught the violin, audiences for Western music and a fascination with Stradivari in particular were at an all-time high. Suddenly you had an entire nation playing the violin it appeared in Japan from nowhere. And Jeff and I were in Japan in 1974 and it was like when the Beatles came to this country when I was about 12 years old. Everybody simply knew about it. Cab drivers talked about Stradivari. It was a cultural event of magnitude. This unprecedented growth spread similarly to Korea, mainland China and Taiwan sending violin prices for the first time beyond the means of musicians. The British violinist Ruth Palmer has very limited access to the world's best violins in the UK. In stark contrast, when she was invited to perform in Taiwan, she was given the choice of any instrument from the vast Qi Mei collection for a few days. The Qi Mei Corporation is the world's biggest high-end plastics manufacturer. Its founder is an amateur violinist and lover of Western art, who not only realizes the philanthropic potential of fine violins, but also the challenge a collection of Western artifacts could present to the dominance of Chinese art in the East. Taiwan, after all, sits between Japan and China and tentatively clings to its independence, a cause with which the corporation's founder is closely linked. Chairman was very young. At that time, it was under the Japanese occupation, I mean, Taiwan. And Chairman liked to visit a small museum run by the Japanese uh, city government. And because the museum was free to get into, so Chairman liked to, to go there and have a look about animals, about painting, about antiquities. And Chairman wished one day if he became really, really rich man, he want to have a museum. Now his dream come true. Go 
This is a spiritual chamber designed for collecting the violin. Here we have 130 violins, 20 cellos, and uh, about 20 violas. The first violin we bought, it was the first Antonio Stradivari violin in Taiwan. Um Yesterday I got this instrument and then I complained all the time with, to the man. I said, no, I don't like this. He said, you are the principal here. You have to, you only can play this instrument. It's a really old one, Montegata. Uh, it's made in 1788. Yeah. This kind of instrument, they have a really special sound. But for us, it's not so easy to play this instrument in a short time. In Taiwan, Chi Mei is not only investing in ever-increasing numbers of violins, but is now planning ways to show its collection and status to the wider world. This is the 生产工厂的内面,这是不正常的,因为过去是有土地问题,种种问题,所以不得已才设立这样的,所以一定将来是在找一个大的土地,而且政府已经有花一些土地给我,所以我们现在开始在提起。So the idea is the government should donate or should offer a land free for us, we donate the collection. This is, this is the deal. So this uh, will become the Tainan Cultural Zone. The importation is non-stop. Every week, we buy and buy. The Germans' idea, if they, to say, if you don't buy this year, Next year, you should pay more to buy. So we keep buying all the time. Owning important string instruments now equates to great power and influence in the music world. The simple act of lending an instrument is increasingly significant in determining the career paths of young soloists. The greatest collection of instruments in, in the UK is the Royal Academy of Music's um, instrument collection. And as I am no longer a student there, I don't have access to those instruments. I think these institutions need to define their policy as to who gets them and what is the criteria, and the Royal Academy probably needs to look at that. The main function of the Academy's collection is to provide instruments to students and professors here. In fact, this is the main difference between this collection and many others around the world. It's possible that if those students did have the instruments for a short time, I mean enough time to start to get to know them for a little while, that that would give them something, an idea of sound that they could then bring to their own instruments. But it takes a long time to, to get to know an instrument. It's not that everyone can play a very good cello and then it will sound. It's not like that. I don't have time to get really involved in the cello because I don't know the cello really well. I'm just playing, I'm trying my best, but we're just giving it back all the time, <laughs> locking it up. <laughs> I don't care who you are. Anyone who has the privilege of playing a great strad um, must see it as a privilege. You know, they can't expect to play them for life. The Royal Academy's policy leaves the UK with no institution to lend instruments to top soloists. 
forcing them into the competitive search for private lenders and sympathetic international institutions. In order to experience the incredible sound of the world's best violins, even for just a few hours, Ruth traveled to America to meet one of the world's leading dealers. What is your experience actually with, with great well, instruments? Well, uh, yeah, I've played, I've played a few strats. A few. Only, only one for, um, well, for any extended period of time. I've never played a Guarneri. You um, haven't? Never. Probably there, there's a step you need to do, which is simply to see some instruments. Yes, and yet. the problem is that the better the violin I try, the better the violin I want. <laughs> Are you going out to see Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, that'll be dizzy. Yeah. <laughs> That is the, the, high, that's the highest it. concentration of great violins on planet Earth. Is it really? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, there's no other collection yeah, there like is, it? There is no higher concentration of bills. Uh, yeah, all at the top. Like many great violinists before her, Ruth went to Seattle to visit the legendary Fulton collection. In the 1980s, David Fulton's unique flair for computer programming brought him wealth beyond most people's wildest dreams. With so few things left unattainable to him, he decided to go in search of the world's great instruments and virtuosos. David Fulton has been a supporter of the Canadian violinist James Ennis since 1999 when he bought the Marsic Stradivari violin for his use. I am the luckiest violinist around to have access to these instruments. I can imagine for, for some people that it would be, be kind of hard to, you know, to see Dave's collection and play for five minutes on each of those instruments and then have to have to say goodbye. <laughs> why do you have so many violins? Well, why not? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't know. It's been fun to collect them. It's been fun to buy them. Also, I like the idea very much of people coming and uh, staying and uh, playing chamber music. I always thought that was a very cool idea. And so uh, one of my ideas was, well, if, uh, if I have a nice collection of instruments, then uh, probably will attract artists to come visit. Yeah. The first visitor in our guest house was actually Isaac Stern. And I had the remarkable pleasure of having, I would guess, 80% of the world's great violinists play in this room. Many of us violinists have had the treat of going into his house um, and, and trying all the instruments. And I mean, having all those great instruments lined up in a row is just, a, it's like a feast. I'll tell you what, why don't we try this Bible? Uh, this is the 1733 Sassoon Strat. So it's a late one. Uh, Stradivari was 89 years old when he made that. Strad sound. It's that's not as warm and amiable as the golden period strads. Uh, I mean, like play the same thing immediately on the Baron Pitt there. You see the difference. The uh, the 1715 strad. I thought uh, it was made. Uh, yeah, that's it. See, she already knows. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's made their acquaintance. <laughs> Canute I really liked, but that's the one that Dave plays himself. <laughs> so I'm never going to prize that out of his hands. I didn't know on my way there how great they would be. I think the Lord Wilton is probably the best violin in the world.
The holy grail for a collector is to own the violin that both players and dealers regard as the best. When the Lord Wilton Del Jesu came on the market in 1999, David Fulton paid a record $6 million to buy it, setting a new benchmark for the value of violins. The first time I saw it, it was sitting in the case like that at the Guarneri show in New York in 1994. And uh, it's the one violin at the show I really, I would come back and stare at it. When you hear something played like the Wilton and Pucelle, I mean, played well, you realize there's, they're in fact great works of art. And uh, the humility comes from realizing you're the custodian of something that's part of the heritage of the human race, actually. It's also great fun to, to listen to them. I mean, the sound of the instruments is ravishing. These violins are not immortal. They started out being, the Hills estimate, 1,200 Stradivarian instruments, correct? They say between five and 600 now exist. Something happened to half of them already. Now, the violins here uh, that are in, in the best condition, they're in that condition because they've not been continuously played by virtuosos and have been in collector's hands. I can't take them with me. Yeah. And I really don't want to leave my kids with the job of disposing of a, of a huge collection. Uh, because, historically speaking, uh, collectors that have held on to all their collections until their deaths have done it rather poorly, I think. Spot the difference. Fairy Platinum 40 pack. Tesco 14 pounds. Asda 5 pounds. Squeak. Stradivari and Guarneri del Gesù's instruments have always been subject to financial speculation. Two notorious cases in the 20th century involved the collections of the reclusive cinema millionaire Gerald Segelman and the flamboyant philanthropist Herbert Axelrod. In London, during the Second World War, Gerald Segelman spent his days seeking out the ultimate violin deal. He went to all the auction houses in search of a bargain and secretly amassed an incredible collection of violins, playing the dealers at their own game. When he died in July 1992, the extent of his collection amazed all but the few who were given access to his secret world. I was involved um, with a man called Gerald Sagelman. He was extremely reclusive. I mean, he made all his money um, in cinemas. He told me, he said, well, he said that, you know, the, the GIs used to queue around the block um, to, to come into the cinema. And with the profits from his cinema trade, he invested in violins. I mean, everybody said how impossible he was, and he was impossible. I mean, lots of people tried to, to see him um, and buy instruments from him. But to my knowledge, I was the only person that handled his, his instruments. Peter Biddle's long friendship with Gerald was rewarded when he was appointed to dispense of the Segelman collection. However, civil suits filed in London in 1997 and Chicago in 1999 unearthed private transactions between sellers, buyers and middlemen. According to court records, in one instance, a Guarneri del Jesu violin was acquired from the Segelman estate for $950,000 and quickly resold for $2.3 million. The dealers and investors said they were simply buying and selling instruments in the same manner the rare violin trade always has been practiced.
The value of violins and the practices used by dealers were again brought into question in New Jersey. It was March of 2002, and Herbert Axelrod is known already as a benefactor to the New Jersey Symphony Orchestra. He'd given them a million dollars. And in March 2002, he comes along and says, have I got a deal for you? He says, I have $50 million worth of violins, a dozen strats, I've got three Del Jesus, and a bunch of other great instruments from the 17th and 18th centuries. And I will give them to you for $25 million. And the eyes at the New Jersey Symphony lit up. It was as if God himself had come down uh, to earth. The New Jersey had to get them. New Jersey was where I was born and raised. It was never a question in my mind. The New Jersey Symphony is between New York and Philadelphia, two very acclaimed orchestras, and they've always had a hard time finding recognition. And, and this was a chance to vault onto the world stage very quickly. What he told the press and what he told the orchestra at that time was he wanted his fiddles to be in his home state where he could uh, come listen to them whenever he wanted to. What he didn't tell them was that he was under investigation by the FBI for tax fraud, and while he was making this pitch, he was liquidating his properties across the United States with the intention of moving to Switzerland. In making his pitch to the orchestra, he, uh, he told them there were a couple of conditions. One, all the instruments had to be taken at once. They couldn't cherry pick. And two, uh, they needed to move fast. I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was just, it seemed too good be, to be true. And it's a dream of a lifetime to have an instrument like this um, long term. If I'd been told that 10 years ago that that would happen, I would have said, no, that's just, that's impossible. Absolutely impossible. The proportion that jump up the level that, uh, that we're experiencing, that I'm experiencing with this violin, uh, has uh, affected my life. Yeah, that it's th that important. There certainly was some of that rationale that a great instrument makes you a great player. But in their language alone, speaking about these instruments, you can see that it wasn't just, we'll have better musicians, it was, we'll become a tourist attraction. I want us to make us well-known. I want us to improve our quality, which is also very high now. Uh, I want us to increase our image. These are the things that I believe will happen. The, the problem when you got to something like Axelrod, these were the marginal instruments in many cases. These were composite and repaired and strange. This wasn't the, the main work of Stradivari and Guarneri del Jesu. They knew that they had some problem instruments they knew they had some instruments that were not by the famous makers to whom they were attributed. They knew it was not worth $50 million. Axelrod's dealer, Dietmar Mackelt, has always stood by the $48.9 million evaluation he gave the New Jersey instruments. The comments which were made about the instruments, 95% um, of the instruments, uh, None of these people ever saw, they judged from photographs, which is an extremely dangerous thing to do. When I look back at the Axelrod case, that's, I think, all a question of power uh, and jealousy. The violin world was always divided, and there were always these uh, dealers which were connected, um, and uh, an agreeable appraisal was just a phone call away. Axelrod might be an extreme example of the violin world, um, but uh, it's not a world that I would want to swim in if I were a musician. I, I would be very wary about buying a big instrument if I had the money to. Every time you pick up a violin in this orchestra, it's better than what you've ever played. So the relative value is, you know, they're worth, they're worth, they're worth whatever we paid for them. That's, that's, you know, that's what I would say is the truth. This is an orchestra that is not rich. They are having serious money woes, and now they have, you know, at the end of 2005, they still had $19 million in debt. It's, it's a tremendous amount of money they owe, and they are barely scraping by. For them to have to give it up and, and put it to bed in the museum, oh, I would be very unhappy with that. The fact that we can use 
pieces of wood that are over 300 years old in many cases is quite extraordinary. And if this instrument were taken away from me tomorrow, uh, I would, I will still be the richer for having experienced the instrument and I, and I would have no regret. In March 2007, the New Jersey Symphony Orchestra's debts became unmanageable and they put their instrument collection back on the market only four years after purchasing them. The buyers were a group of American investors, encouraged no doubt by the historical precedent of violins increasing in value even at times when house prices crashed. I worked out that between 1961 and 1996, in this country, houses and violins of the top quality had gone up by exactly the same amount, but curiously, at totally different times. And about three or four years ago, suddenly the very top of the market started getting a little bit of competition in. I hear mutterings of very wealthy people buying them as an investment now. Investment bankers have always searched for financial potential in alternative assets, and schoolboy memories of orchestra rehearsals spent peering into each other's violins, hoping to find the name Stradivari, are often enough to excite a wealthy man's curiosity. Why do you need more than one violin, honestly? You only have two arms, you know. <laughs> it's like, oh, why do you need more than one car? Um, yeah. You know, to me, having bought one violin, then I started looking seriously at the... Um, long-term potential and actually I figured that given that I, I thought they were actually very sound investments and they would appreciate the potential of me having a number of violins and then being able to loan them out to up-and-coming artists that was pretty attractive yeah. and actually to go to a concert and hear somebody play your violin and know it's made a dramatic difference to um, the sound quality and hopefully uh, you know help their career advance yeah. it, it's, a, it's something that makes you feel good Talking about violins as investments works for me in as much as that means that I can then go to someone that has money to invest and say, please will you buy this violin for my use and by the way you'll make some money. Um, the downside to that means that the instruments are becoming more and more out of my reach. There really hasn't been a period of time where violins have declined in value. They've actually increased and, and a, a lot of people do feel, as I say, with China opening up in other markets, that. Um, the rate that they will increase um, may, may actually uh, step up from here. I think I'm very close to the end of the line for private collectors of these things. If you buy an instrument for some of the prices that are now being quoted, which are ridiculous, I heard that there's one Del Jesu, not as good as any of the ones on the piano, in my opinion, but I think the price that was quoted was something like 16 million pounds for the violin. No one's volunteered to pay 16 million pounds for the violin. I wish they would. That would be delightful, because the price of all my instruments would then go up substantially. But at any rate, these violins are going that way. I think they're going in institutional hands. Unfortunately, if a violin ends up in a museum and it's not played at all, I would say that's the equivalent of taking taking the Mona Lisa and putting it in a, in a closet and where you can't see it at all because the violin's beauty comes out when you play on it. Well, that's, that's always been the funny thing with violins. They're not quite artwork. I, I don't know that it's something that people want to look at alongside the, the Renoirs and the Monets and the, because then they go look at a Stradivari other and say, oh, it's a Stradivari, but then go on. I, I don't think it has much meaning. After a year spent traveling the world to experience the magical sound of the finest violins, even for just a tantalizing moment, Ruth is now back in the UK, waiting to experience the magic again in her own country. difficulties of trying to obtain the use of a nice instrument and of course the prohibitive cost. The sound is 
just magic. I think now is the time that I really do need a violin for long term because I, I feel that I'm ready. I know what violins can do. I know the difference between various types of instruments. Now I really just need something that I can rely on. It's a great, great thing until such a time as uh, somebody decides that I'm no longer allowed to play on it. And I mean, already for me, I can feel that that could be catastrophic. And there is that feeling in the strap that, you know, that I love it so much. It really does feel like part of me. I don't want to imagine life without it, but I know there will be. And meanwhile, I just you know, make the very most of it. Through my life, I was so lucky to make a career uh, which now lasts nearly 35 years. Uh, and as we speak about these instruments, we simply speak about money. So it is totally clear for me that when I don't play it anymore for whatever reason, that somebody else who is not able to afford it for the known reasons uh, has to play it. I always think that it's something anyway that nobody really owns. I think instruments are a bit like children in that way. You just, they're guardians for a while and you, you, you spend some time with them and they go on living after you. Stradivari's Messiah reminds us that a great violin alone makes no sound. A solemn warning of the consequence of violins being separated from players able to give them their voice. I guess it's just every man for himself. <laughs> I have to just try my best to get my hands on a good instrument and, um, and hope that it's a good instrument that I love. Great musicians like Ruth Palmer will always want to play on those sacred instruments made in Cremona 300 years ago. The decision as to whether they're allowed or able to do so is sadly no longer in their hands. Thank you.